record. Okay, let's go. So pleasant good morning, everyone. Today, this is lecture three, we'll be looking at the cell. All right, so is the cell important? Okay, that's a rhetorical statement. Of course it is, and it's the reason why we study it. One of the things you should appreciate when you're looking at the body itself, it does not produce structures or substances that it doesn't need. In other words, then your body, the machine is, it doesn't do things for fun because every time it does things in terms of creation, it utilizes energy. And that is very important for the, um, the, the running of the entire system, the body system. And in general, it doesn't do it for fun. All right. So all these things which we are studying, it's where they are very important and the body makes them because they have functions associated with it. So that is very important. So, you know, whenever or should you ever get a question, you know, is something produced by the body important? No. If however is something comparative, if this is more important than that, well, okay, now you could relate those two things. But in general, you know, you just look at it from the perspective that everything that is made in the body, it is indeed important. All right, so in terms of certain terms associated with the cell, right, we have cytology, which is the study of cells, and we also have, we also have in terms of the structure of the cells, the cell itself shows certain characteristics, and this is related to the organization. We look at different types of cells, and we would see that they're organized in a particular way. We'd see the metabolism associated with the cell. That is how it utilizes certain substances that come into it, particularly as it relates to sugar. Now, when we speak about the breakdown of sugar to generate energy in the form of ATP, which is one of the basic characteristics of all the cells present in our bodies, have to remember the role, of course, that the pancreas plays in the secretion of insulin. We speak more to that when we look at digestion. But just a short term, just to say, we do know we have, for instance, two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Does anybody know the difference between the two, type 1 and type 2? One is insulin something, and one is insulin something. Two words, let me see if anybody, so it's just a word. I don't want a long explanation. I want one word, type one. Insulin resistance. What you're saying, right? Insulin resistance and type two, wait, in, no, 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 type one. That, what you're described as type two is insulin resistance. What is type one? So in other words, with type one, you're not having enough insulin being produced. So what would you say is a word that begins with I? Insulin in, if you don't have enough, you have- like, Insufficient. I was, insufficient. Correct, I was not going to say when you go to the in, e, ATM or you, look, you know, you see insufficient funds, like what? Yes, insufficient. So type one is often defined as um, insufficiency, whereas type two is resistance. And this has to do with the insulin. All insulin, somebody want to explain to me in a, sim in a simple way, how it is, what is the role of insulin in terms of getting sugar from the blood into the cell? What could it be likened to? Something in your house. So is it like a passageway or something? Like yeah, it you could draw that parallel or more specifically, yes, it's like a key. So insulin, if you want to look at it, like that, insulin is a key, like your front door. You can't get in unless it's there. So sugar has to get into the cells. After we eat, not only you have complex carbohydrates, which ultimately break down into sugars, but sugar is a primary source of energy in the body itself. But other substances, namely protein and fats, they are also metabolized in the cell. But for, in terms of the most studied um, breakdown of product, we always look at sugar. And that process of breaking down sugar to generate elect to generate energy that is known as if something begins with G and literally it means sugar cutting sugar glycolysis very good glycolysis yeah so glycolysis is very simply breaking down of sugar to generate simpler substances and most critically ATP and that is another level of the cell we look more to that as mentioned in 
digestion, so I wouldn't go into too much detail right now. Suffice it to say, in terms of the role of insulin, you have sugar in your blood after digestion. And now what happens, the insulin that is secreted by the pancreas is like a key, a master key. It could go to these cells and open channels. And these channels are very specific for allowing in sugar. So the sugar then goes into the cell. And what happens when it gets into the cell? This process of glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. Sugar is taken in and it's broken down into carbon dioxide, water, and most critically, energy, energy in the form of ATP. When we have issues as relates to diabetes, this is what happens. Type 1, insulin insufficiency. Not enough insulin is actually secreted. So what happens? Persons who have type 1 diabetes, they have to inject insulin. So those are the ones who have to inject. Type 2 is insulin resistance. So literally, the insulin is there but the cells, it comes like the lock is damaged. So insulin is trying to open the lock, the sugar door, and is not, is not working. So in cases like that, interestingly, in most cases, it is reversible. Oftentimes, you do get type 2 diabetes occurring in persons who are overweight or obese. But interestingly enough, it is reversible by exercise and proper diet for persons for which that doesn't work, there are medi uh, medicinal interventions which are used. But suffice it to say, type 1, not enough insulin. So therefore, yes, you have the sugar present in the blood, but just have not enough keys to open the cells, um, the door, the sugar door to the cells to let the sugar in. And in type 2, yes, there is enough insulin, but just for some other reason, it's just not the door, it's just not working the keys, right? So therefore, you don't have the sugar going into the cell to be broken down to generate energy. And what happens when the sugar remains in your blood? When high levels of, of sugar remains in your blood for um, you know excessive periods of time, what could happen? Could that have any damage to the body? Yes. It could damage your organs, sir. How does it damage your organs? Um, if the blood sugar goes too high, remember, um, I think if I Correct. When you say with homeostasis, your body wants to maintain a certain um, Correct. system within it. So too much sugar will throw the body out of whack and therefore in trying to get the body back down to what the sugar level should be, the organs could be damaged because I don't know if it's either you're overworking it or something in the sugar. I like, a, I like how you're thinking and you're very close to it. Your logic is sound. So having, it, very simplistically, I think well you said it in a sense, having too much sugar present in the blood, what does it do? It damages, it does. Just the presence of the sugar in the cell, it damages the endothelial lining in particular of the microcirculation in your body. So what do we mean by microcirculation? The very fine um, arterioles, capillaries, um, and venules which are present in your blood. The endothelial lining, it, it damages those cells. And why is that important? Well, when you look at all the organs, basically every organ you have, they do have microcirculations, very fine circulations associated with them. So when you're looking at your heart, when you're looking at your kidneys, when you're looking at your lungs, it, well, to your lungs, yeah, your lungs does have microcirculation. When you're looking at the brain, when you're looking at your eyes, all of these things, they have very fine circulation, a microcirculation associated with them. This sugar, what it does, it damages the endothelial cells present in, this, in the vessels of, um, associated with microcirculation. And that's how it damages it. Ultimately, if left unchecked, it will damage your eyes, it will damage your kidneys, it will damage your liver, it will damage you know, all the organs virtually if left unchecked. Again, as well, when in terms of microcirculation, you're looking at the body itself, distal structures from the heart, when you're looking at the legs, let's say, particularly with the legs, because in terms of the return of blood from the legs, you wouldn't look at this until SNF2, but in terms of return of blood from vein, from the inferior vena cava, it has to be done through the action of the um, your calf muscle, right? Your calf. So one of the things, if it is you do have damage to the vessels themselves, you have poor circulation occurring. 
right? Sometimes the damage could be that the blood will not be circulated well in terms of through this microcirculation. All that being said, that's how diabetes actually um, causes problems because it interferes, the sugar present in the blood interferes with the microcirculation, specifically the endothelial lining of these vessels. And left unchecked, yeah, it damages them. And sometimes it could be damaged irreparably. So that is why it's always important when you're talking about diabetes, always to keep your sugar in line. Okay, so all of that, quite rightly, as your colleague just mentioned, homeostasis. You have certain levels, acceptable levels of sugar in the blood. These must be maintained. And if left unchecked, it will cause damage to your organs. Characteristics, growth and reproduction, right? We, we emphasize reproduction, even at the cellular level, cells replicate. And how do we know that cells replicate? Do we bathe every day? Okay, don't answer that question. We bathe, or let's say some of us will take a sponge off. If you, when you're taking a sponge off, one of the things you will notice when you use your rag, and let's say you wipe your forearm, you will notice like, quote unquote, black stuff comes off on the rag itself. What is in that black stuff? Anybody wants to hazard a guess? So you wipe your forearm and you see some black things on your hand. What, what's in that black stuff? Dead yeah, skin. it's dead skin and of course, well, oil and so on or whatever you might encounter, but it is dead skin cells. Now, would it be a problem if your body did not replace those dead skin cells? Would that be a problem? Yes, it, yes. I believe it would yeah. have a problem. Yeah, that would be a, if, it, if it didn't replace those dead, what would happen? Your skin will be dry, it will... If you keep rubbing it off, what would happen eventually? Hello, one day you'll see bone. You'll see bone, exactly. Because it, every time you, if it wasn't replaced, every, you just keep going down. You see your hand getting thinner and thinner until one day, hello, you see bone. It's like, Lord, right? Of course, I say that in jest, but that's the reality of it. So constantly your body has to replace these cells. Where do you think in your body are cells replaced the most? that they have to be done in a very short space of time is, a, is a related to one of the organ systems. Which one do you think it is? Where the I cells have to replace the most? Yeah, the cells. Skeletal, okay, that is one. Huh? Anybody else? Well, the skeletal system. Skin. Okay, we have skeletal. We have the skin. Muscular. We have the muscular. All right, anybody else? I don't want to burst all your bulb, but you hit the answer yet. But those were good answers, but you haven't hit the red, answer yet. Cardiovascular. Red, red cardiovascular and your red vessel, red vessel. Now that is interesting, but no. So ask the question again. Which organ? So in your body, there are certain areas where cells are replaced very, very quickly in terms of the turnover time and is associated with one of the organ systems. Which one do you think it is? Now I'll have to double check with blood. I never thought about that. System? Skeletal system, I want to say no. no. So the integumentary? Integumentary yes. system, I want to say no. No. Nervous system. No. <laughs> what about the digestive system? Thank you very much. The digestive system. Right, it might sound funny. Why? Anybody okay. wants to ask, why do you think your digestive system, those cells have to be replaced a lot or very quickly? One word, it begins with F. Food. food, yes, and another word beginning with F, because when the food is passing down through your alimentary canal, from your mouth all the way to your anus, is your what, feces, what do you have? Uh, Rubbing, yes, so feces ultimately comes out, but what happens to that food as it relates? Friction. Friction. And, yes, that is the word I was looking for, very good. Friction occurs, and so every time you eat, if you can imagine, it rubs off cells. So one of the things as well, for if anybody wants to get into, get into forensic science, in terms of getting um, tissue, uh, cell samples, and by extension, DNA, you could actually get it from fecal matter, right? So always remember, you know, I know you have some people who, let's say you rent a place and you don't like it, 
and blah, blah, blah. You, you have a follow up with the landlord and, you know, they take the feces and smear it all over the wall. Yeah, depending on how fresh it is, the landlord could do a DNA test. And actually, on because of the fact epithelial cells are, are rubbed off all the time as food passes through from the mouth down to the anus. And by extension as well, which is why whenever they're doing a DNA test, where do they swab? Inside, inside your mouth. mouth. Inside, inside your mouth. mouth, exactly. So your cheeks, right? And that's why, because the cells come out, they're very easy. And it has to do with the structure. Now, of course, if it was, yeah, they're just built in terms of the layout, right? It's, it comes out very easily. Would it be a problem if, they, if it was difficult to remove those cells from the alimentary, from your mouth all the way down to your anus? Would that be a problem? If, it, if they didn't come off easy, would that be a problem? So let's say if it was, let's say, like your skin, you know, in terms of that texture, imagine you have the skin, texture of your skin going all the way from your mouth to your anus. Would that be a problem? Yes, sir. Yes. It would be hard for the food particles to pass. And what body. would happen? So what would happen? If you had skin. Down right. And when you line and break down, what happens? I'm beginning with H. A medical term beginning with H. And also it begins with B. Thank you. What you saying? Only on top tongue, Janel. On top you get your hemorrhage. So every imagine every time you eat something, it's only you're only bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Right? That'd be a big problem, a huge problem. Because in particular, we have on average 5.5 liters of blood. That would be a huge problem. So that means all the time, virtually all the energy you get will be in creating blood all the time, blood cells. So that would be very wasting. So in terms of your body, the machine, what it has done. It has actually deliberately set up the, the alimentary canal from mouth to anus such that the cells come off very easily to allow for the easy passage of food. All right, so very good in terms of picking up on that. Let's go forward. All right, so looking at these structures, we need a microscope. Has anybody seen a micro? Okay, uh, again. Yes, I'm just saying that, so don't think. Um, uh, being insulting or anything. Anybody, everybody has seen a microscope, yes, or used it. Uh, maybe I should ask that. Has everybody okay. used a microscope? Yeah. Right? Okay. So, of course, when you do look um, in a microscope, you see things very, very small. Right? Hence, in a micro small scope is ready to see. Excuse me. And what comes to mind is the Cell University of Utah. Uh, urchin. Mm. Measure microscopic virtual urchin, right? Here we go. I want to say this is it. Let's see. <laughs> no, actually, this is not it. Okay, so I would send this um, link in the chat. Let me just overlay it. You all seeing it? You all seeing this, yes? Yes, yes sir. sir. Let me send the link one time to you all. It's a very interesting link. Um, let me just quickly have a look to appreciate. Let me send it. Appreciate the size of things. And you know, at your own, at your own um, leisure, you can have a look at it. So. Okay. All right. So let's have a look. Mm -hmm. All right. So everybody familiar with times regular 12 point? In terms of font size, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Time time new one, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're familiar with a 
coffee bean then, yeah? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, for all the Starbucks people or, or whomsoever, let's go in a little bit, Zoom. What about sesame seed? You know, when you buy a kiss bread and them little yeah. things yeah. sprinkle on it? Yes. <laughs> so the size of each one is about three by two millimeters. So look at it in, in comparison to a coffee bean. So we're going in smaller. What about a grain of salt? Yes. A grain of salt is approximately 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. We're going in again. So an amoeba, which is a microscopic organism, this is about 500 micrometer. In terms of the conversion, you have to recognize is a thousand micrometers actually make one millimeter. So we're going really small now. So we're going smaller. Paramecium is another one. The size of a skin cell is approximately 30 micrometers. All right, so remember the conversion is 1,000 of these, 1,000 micrometers is one millimeter. And you might say, what is a millimeter? If you, take, if you take your thumb and your forefinger and you squeeze it together and then release it, as soon as, you know, as soon as you see a little space between them, your thumb and your forefinger, after when you release it, I don't know if you're all doing that now, if you hold it up to the light. And you know, as soon as you now start to see a space, that is one millimeter. So imagine you're dividing that into a thousand. That little space there into a thousand that is one micrometer. 30 of those, that's the diameter of a skin cell. As I tell you how small it is. We're going again. A red blood cell is eight micrometers. The little space between your thumb and forefinger, divide that into a thousand and eight of those little one thousandth of a speed of a of a millimeter is actually that is the diameter of a red blood cell. We're going smaller. Let's go a little smaller. Right, this is bacteria. This is E. coli. This is one nice cause, you know. Um, especially is found on food, which is why it's important to clean the kitchen and. Um, to avoid cross-contamination. This is like three by 0.6. A lysosome, which is we look at the structure of the cell is one micrometer and the mitochondria is four by 0 0.8 micrometer in terms of the size. We're going smaller, right? When we think about the HIV virus, it's 130 nanometers. Now, what is a nanometer? Well, that is one billionth. All right, so we have micrometer. The next is one billionth of a um, of a meter, one, one, uh, 1,000 micrometers make a millimeter. And now you have 1 million nanometers actually make one millimeter. So I tell you how small these viruses are. So once again, the little space between your thumb and forefinger, imagine you're dividing that into a million sections. And a hundred of those sections, that is actually, um, 100 of those million sections, if you take those together, that is what the diameter of an HIV virus is. All right, coated vesicle, hepatitis is 45, rhinoviruses, 13 nanometers as found in your nose, ribosome energy, we'll see that in a little bit. Hemoglobin, that is the um, iron component of uh, red blood cells. The iron and protein component is 6.5 nanometers. Right, phospholipid is just showing you how small these things are until you come down a picometer. A picometer is one with 12 zeros, 1,000 billionth of a millimeter. That's the size of one carbon atom. All right, so when it is nice to appreciate, you know, the size of these things, you're coming back up, hepatitis, right around here is where we'll find our good friend COVID, HIV right, bacteria, because it's skin cell, a human egg, uh, you know, important to note in terms of the size, human egg, the diameter is 130 micrometers, the sperm is 60, that is long by five micrometers in length. So let me ask you this, now, when you're thinking about fertilization, right, so the, you have certain not only the genes are passed from um, between the two, male and female, of course, the air comes from the female, sperm comes from the male, but also mitochondria, right? Mitochondria are the structures which provide energy to 
all cells and by extension, the entire body, right, the mitochondria. So let me, where do you think you get most of your mitochondria from? Based on this diagram, do you think you get most from your father or do you get most from your mother? From your mother. Madam. Okay, your somebody mom? say mother, somebody say mom, all right. Anybody say dad? Do you get most of it from? Nobody say, excellent. And yeah, you're quite right. You get most of your mitochondria, most if not all of your mitochondria, probably about 80 to 90% from your mother. So there's a way in which um, they could actually track uh, along maternal lines to check to see which, um, which species is, has been the oldest on the earth. All right. I wouldn't get into so much, too much details, but, I, but there's a way to do it, tracking along maternal lines. And using that, of course, they were able to identify that originally a uh, man came out of Africa, right? using tracking through the maternal lines, right? in terms of diet. I wouldn't get into too much details, but just suffice it to say, you know, from any scientific field is a well-known fact that life as we know it related to humans you know, originated in Africa, and they were able to do it. There are numerous papers written on it, and is that what? Is it's because it? of the Eve, the Eve gene. The pardon? Is it because of the Eve gene that they could it could be traced back to Africa? I don't know if it's called the Eve gene. I haven't seen that term in terms of in journal articles. Maybe it is referred to as the Eve gene um, in certain other uh, literature, but. Possibly, I could see them calling it the Eve gene, but but no, they use mitochondria because um, the mitochondria itself does have DNA, so they they were able to trace it that way. Like I say, um, you will you look at that more in SNF too when you look at reproduction, all that to say, but it does have something to do with yes, tracing the mitochondrial DNA. Right, the DNA that is present in the mitochondria to see which one has the greatest degree of diversity. But I don't want to trouble you over the details now, and it is not on the um, it's not on the syllabus, so you wouldn't get into that. But just appreciate the fact that life did originate in Africa from a scientific perspective, and that is accepted in the scientific field as a known fact in the scientific field. So if you say otherwise in any scientific um, setting, you'll be laughed at, really. Okay, so when you do have your chance, have a look at this, it's, it's rather interesting. So types of microscope, compound transmission and scanning, when we're looking at the multiple choice, we'll get into a little more details of each one. So form and function. When we say form, what does it refer to? Anatomy or physiology, I forgot. Physiology. Right? Anatomy. Right? Anatomy. Right? Or oh, structure, sorry. So it's really structure and function. That would really threw you off because you're thinking of the F sound. I appreciate what yep. you're saying. Right. It's, oh, all right. When, when I did give the response, I said structure and function. So if, if you replace this with structure and function, right? Structure um, refers to anatomy and form is function with the F sound. So mm -hmm. I'm mad at you, right? When we look at a neuron, Here's a neuron. It is adapted to form and function because it takes input from a distal site, right? And then it passes it along to other neurons. So we do see that. This intestinal epithelium, how is this adapted to form and function? Anybody want to say, look at the form of it and how is it related to its function? Long story short, you find this line in your gut. So mm -hmm. this part here, how is it related to function? Anybody? The small here is a function. Wider area surface here. Very good. It increased these projections, and somebody mentioned, well, they're very similar to here's, quite so, but they actually have a blood supply associated with them. But they're similar to here. It does look like here, but they, it has a blood supply associated with them. And what this does, it increases the surface area and having a greater surface area is essential for absorbing. If you have a bigger surface area, you're able to absorb a lot more. So both of you all were correct in terms of making the parallel with here, right? But uh, the ultimate reason for this is really to increase the surface area. When you increase the surface area, you're able to absorb more. Yeah, so very good. I applaud both of you all for 
um, putting forward your responses. So these are some of the structures associated with a cell. Let's have, go into a little more detail um, here and talk about them. This is the nucleus. What is it, when, what is the nucleus often referred to as? What, what brain. Uh, the brain of the cell. So therefore it does all the things associated with the cell. You know, so this is the brain, very important. So what would happen to a cell if you pull out the nucleus, you think, what do you think would happen to the cell? Da, 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 it would da. Die. Yeah, it, it would be. die, right? So, um, so it's always important the nucleus to protect the nucleus. That is the most important part. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? So it's studied, it's studied by these structures known as ribosomes. And what do the ribosomes do? They make a substance. Do they make proteins, carbohydrates, or fats? Proteins. Proteins. If ever you get a question um, in a, <laughs> a multiple choice and they're asking you about structure in, um, be it in a body or in a cell, I would say your best guess would be to go for proteins because proteins are really the things that they're the functional things. They do things. You know, it's come like, um, you know, when you were smaller, what do you use? Play Doh. I don't know what they'd call it now. You can make things with it. You could do a whole lot of things with protein. So all I've been said, if I got a question with protein, yeah. And if you're doubting, go with proteins. Proteins are the things, you know, the as the action things in the in the body itself. They're used for so many different things. So the ribosomes, right, they do make proteins. And the only difference between normal endoplasmic reticulum or smooth endoplasmic reticulum, as it's called, and rough endoplasmic. Anybody want to tell me the difference between these two structurally? What do you think is just one difference? One has what and one ha doesn't have it. One has ribosomes and the other doesn't. Thank you. Yeah. So the rough has and the smooth doesn't. So the rough, they associated, is usually associated with protein manufacture. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it does not have um, ribosomes and is associated with lipid or fat manufacture, the smooth ERs, all right? Golgi apparatus, when we think about the Golgi, when you, what comes to mind for me, Golgi sounds like grocery. And when you go by the counter and after they, um, you buy your stuff, what do they do with it? And you pay for it. What do they do with your groceries? Package. They package it, right, very good, they package it. So Golgi, it usually packages things in the cell. Remember Golgi, grocery, packages things. Cytosol. The cytosol is a liquid portion of the cell itself. The cytosol plus all of the organisms make up the cytoplasm. All right? So the cytosol is just a liquid part of the cell alone. Cytosol plus all of these structures that you find in it, the nucleus, the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, peroxisome. Cytosol plus all of these structures is the cytoplasm. We good? That clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me ask you this question. So what is what is the function of the cytosol? What is the provider aqueous um, area for metabolism? Why is that watery. important? Yeah, but why is that Everything important? Because we need to have water to. And we need to have reaction in the cell. Yeah. Correct. So both of you always saying it, correct? Thank you. Both of you all say all of the reactions associated with metabolism, they have to take place in water. They can't take place in a dry environment. And that is why you could preserve things by putting salt on it. Because when you put salt, you pull out all the water. When you pull out all the water, no reactions could occur. So therefore, the tissue that you're looking at will just remain as is. You wouldn't have any decay because any bacteria that comes along, that same salt will pull out the water from them. They wouldn't be able to do their reactions within the bacteria. They will die. So it's a preservative. That's why salt was used for many years as a preservative and is still used to this day to make salt fish. Anybody here like salt fish? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. And all due respect to certain religions, but you know, pickling, like in pigtail and so on. And you know, you, you put salt. And that's the reason why. Because it, the tissue wouldn't decay 
because it wouldn't have bacteria coming in and eating it and producing waste product that have this foul smell, right? So it wouldn't have that happening. And it's all of that because of the fact that in the cytosol, that's where you have those reactions occurring. Reactions. We mentioned as well, you know, earlier that glycolysis, breakdown of sugar, it occurs in the cyto, the liquid portion, the cytoplasm, right? But specifically the liquid portion of the cell, that's where you have those reactions occurring. So that, so in there you'd find these specific enzymes associated with those reactions and that's where they occur. Pull out our water, psh, everything shuts down. Good. So here we have the lysosome. What does the lysosome do? One word begins with D. Digest. Yes, but that's to an extent, yes, because digestion does imply breakdown. Another word, stronger than that, has some violent leanings towards its, its um. Destroy? Thank you, destroy, yes. So the lysosome is destroyed. If something got old in the cell, let's say Mr. Mitochondria, you reach 105, what happens is protein comes and tags it for destruction. And when the lysosome sees it, la, 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 it sees, it comes like, you know, you're putting up a flag, hello. What it will do, it will engulf it and break it down. And then reuse the, uh, in this case, if it's protein, it will reuse, let's say, the amino acids, right? But the lysosome, that's what it does, it destroys. And how it does it, it will engulf it, right? It will come and form a, all around it. And then the enzymes are released. When the enzyme are released, it will literally break it down, break down the structure into simpler ones. And then they are actually, as in this case here, they, are, they could be released uh, externally or they could be uh, packaged in a vacuole and then released. So they could form a vesicle with the membrane and release it outside, or it could package it, make a little uh, vesicle, and then this vesicle is released or stored within the lysosome, sorry, within the cell until the time comes for it to be released. All right, I think peroxisome, this one is in digestion in terms of breakdown of material. So both the peroxisome and the lysosome, they are similar in terms of breakdown. They're associated with the breakdown of material. The peroxisome is specific for breakdown of material needed for the, to provide energy for the cell itself. So this one is associated with breakdown of foods, but this one is associated with breakdown of worn out structures within the cell itself. All right, anything? I think we got all the structures. Did we leave out any? Microvilli, again, these um, are associated with absorption and again, increase in surface area, the villi. So you have a greater surface area. If you were to follow, let's say measure, you know, going up and down, up and down, all the way to here, as opposed to coming in a straight line. Which one will be longer? Going up and down, up and down, or going straight? Which one will be longer, you think? Bina, what do you think? The up and down here. Yeah. The up and down, yeah. So it's that is how, down, correct. And that's how, that's what we mean by increasing surface area. So increasing the distance in which absorption could occur. Right, so that is one of the important properties associated not only with the cell, but you see it repeated in your body in different structures as well. Could you think of any other structure that has an up and down or a coiled shape, you know, to increase surface area? I would say um, your... Your lungs, I hear what you're saying. Your yes, whole intestines. Your whole intestine, yeah, because it's in a small area. So what it does is wind up, you know, your intestines go up and down, left and right, correct is right. You know, any other organ in particular that has a, um, like a coiled structure or surface? Your yeah, brain. Your brain, very good, very good, Misha, yeah. Your brain, you know, and that is all about surface area. You're trying to get as much within a very small space, as much going on in a small space. Very good, let's continue. So the nucleus, this is just speaking about it. Nucleus contains DNA and this is, DNA is important for it's the hereditary in information associated with the cell itself. And this shows how DNA is actually arranged. You have a double helix and this double helix, helix has the bases inward and you have a sugar phosphate backbone. So you have phosphate pointing out and it's really sugars which form the backbone. So it's a sugar 
together with phosphates form the backbone. And then you have these bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine that actually form, it's like a ladder, the rungs of a ladder. So imagine you take a ladder, but like the ladder was made out of gummy bears, so you could twist it. And when you twist it, that is basically what DNA looks like. Right? And these DNA now, they are wrapped around proteins known as histones, and it's wrapped around there to increase surface area. You can think about it like thread on a bobbin or you know, thread on a reel, you wrap it. So you have a whole lot you know, of thread in a very small area. And that's what histones do. Right? So it's coiled, it's very much coiled up. And that is one of the important things with DNA. You'll speak more into that when you get into reproduction. Okay, there's the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, as you mentioned, ER associated with lipids formation, the ribosomes, protein formation, Golgi apparatus, packaging, that's what it does. And the mitochondria are very important for ATP formation. Cytoskeleton, huh, what is the importance of the cytoskeleton in a cell? You ever wondered how things get wrong in a cell? It does give it shape, sir. It gives it shape, right? But it also forms like a road network, right? Because, you, you know, you ever think about, okay, let's say um, a vesicle, need, you need exocytosis or you need the contents of a vesicle to be secreted externally. How does it know where to go? Huh. And like previously, we, men we mentioned like how you could, if an organelle, all of these things are known as organelle, the structures within a, cell because it literally is a small organ like the mitochondria the nucleus all of these things they're known as organelles small organs how do they move around how do they know where to go let's say if you tag an old ribosome or an old mitochondria for destruction how does it know to move from where it is to the lyso to the lysosome for destruction huh well the thing is there's this road network that actually runs through the cell and it's very important that this network exists because all of the structures, the organelles, they move along this. So it's not, they're not just floating. Oftentimes we think about the cytoplasm or the cytosol, which is the liquid part. You know, it's just liquid and these things are just floating aimlessly. Yes, that is true to an extent, but more importantly, they move orderly. They're roads. It's this road network made up of proteins and it forms the cytoskeleton. Right, and it composed of these microfilaments. So these organelles actually move along them very orderly. So it's not haphazard. And it's really mind boggling when you think about it. All of these things are occurring at something that is, what, 50, um, 1,000, the size of that little space between your fingers. All of these things are happening in those little cells, right? If you were looking at the skin cells. Mind boggling, I tell you. It really points to the fact that, you know, indeed the human body is really a machine. Really is a very well polished machine. So, this slide will give you all of the specifics as it relates to um, what they do and so on. And as I mentioned, um, I would post this at the end of class, I will post this in the chat, in the WhatsApp group, so you can have a look. Okay. Now, reproduction, reproduction. Um, Necessary for growth. We mentioned earlier, yes, whenever you take your shower, whenever you wipe with a rag, even let's say when you go to the little boys or the little girls' room, right, and you wipe with toilet paper, even in the area of the, of the rectum, uh, when you're wiping there, what is happening is you're actually wiping off cells. So important, those cells have to be replaced. Yeah. So that, is, uh, that as well points to the fact that how the alimentary canal from mouth to anus all the way down, those cells constantly have to be replaced, constantly, all the time. So they have, you know, they're, they're loosely attached, but not a sign that they're constantly replaced. So you need to have replication occurring all the time. Apoptosis, this is natural cell death. When would you need cells to grow? When we are looking at reproduction, and if you were to think about the development of your hand, when you're looking at the level of the embryo, your hand actually looks like a table tennis paddle, right? Like a circle, right? From below the level of the, above the level of the wrist, if we're looking at probably about week, at week, week 12, the hand looks like a, a paddle, it's a circle. 
So how do you get fingers? How would you get fingers from a circle? Well, you have to cut out all the spaces that are in between the fingers. That makes sense? If you have a circle, it comes like if you trace your hand on the screen, you have to cut out all the spaces. And if you remove the space, that's how you get fingers. So what does the body do? Well, it sends a signal, literally, to tell all of the cells in this, where the space is after the fingers, it tells them to die. And they do. They're like, okay. And they die, and that's how you get fingers being formed. Because all these spaces, where these spaces are originally used to have tissue. But a signal is sent to them, die. And when they die off, right, boom, you have fingers. All right, so apoptosis is natural cell death. This is very important. Necrosis, of course, is cell death due to injury or tissue. This is a little different. This one, this is done programmed, natural. I prefer the word program cell death, right? So this one involves a uh, signal, but this one is due to injury in terms of the, of the cells dying, okay? This is just showing the cell cycle. So for mitosis to occur, the division, this takes one to three hours, but notice, hello, 22 hours. Most of the time is spent in preparation for division. So very important to recall, you have to prepare yourself before the division occurs. Anybody here could cook? Yes, sir. Anybody here yes. could cook well? Yes, sir. What's well, yes, the most sir. important thing when you're cooking? When you look at prep, which one is longer? The actual time you cook or the prep time? Prep time. Prep time. Prep time, prep time. Prep time. yes. You're, if it is you're doing stew chicken, right? You got to cut up the seasoning. You got to go outside and look oh. for the shadow benny. Right, you have to cut it up, right? You have to, you have to, you have to do so many different things, right? Before you actually, um, and before you actually cook, and then when the time comes to cook, it doesn't take very long. Yes. So in a very similar way with the cell cycle, getting ready for the division takes the longest time, but the actual division eh, it doesn't take all that much time. And these are the phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And there are certain arrangements of the um, chromosomes that occur. And we'll look at that in just a little bit when we go to the questions. All right, so this is pointing to it. You can look at it now. Here you have prophase. So the, after the interphase, right, you have prophase, metaphase. There's usually the phase that is brought in questions. And what, what is special about this phase? Look at this phase and look at these other two phases. What would you say is special? Use your eye. What is special about this phase as it relates to the chromosomes? What is special chromosomes about this? They line up. They line up where? To the middle. Correct is right. Thank you very much. They line up to the middle. And that is the important thing with metaphasic chromosomes line up to the middle. And as I said, usually when, um, let's say for any multiple choice or otherwise, it's usually metaphase and anaphase. These are the two that are usually given, and you know they'll ask you for it. But out of the two, metaphase is usually the number one. So let's say you get a question and you can't remember which one is which phase. When in doubt, go for metaphase, right? Usually, because that's usually the one um, that is asked on, on the questions. Okay, transcription, translation. This refers to the copying of the DNA. DNA carries the hereditary material. That is how, for instance, we know that from one species to the next, everything is copied at the level of the cell because of the fact within each cell, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. And on these 23 pairs of chromosomes, you have all the information necessary to make an entire human being. Mind boggling. Remember this thing is less than, we're talking about on the order of nanometers in size. Yet within that cell, it has all the information to make an entire human being. Wow, this is absolutely incredible when you think about it that way. But good, it's real. Of course, not every cell will make a, a lot of the information is just not used, right? So for instance, when you're looking at the instructions to make a toenail, well, only the chapter on toenail will be used. But in reality, all the cells, they do have all the information necessary to make an entire human, except that along the way, they become specialized. And when they become specialized, it come like, you know, they report all the other chapters. They're like, all right, they're there, but we're not using it. 
we're just concentrating on toenail because we have become specialized as a toenail cell. So we'll only be looking at toenail. And when we replicate, we'll only replicate and form toenail cells. And that's what they do, yeah? So very important to recognize that fact. The 23 pairs of chromosomes, they do exist in all the cells, um, but the cells, when they become, again, when you're looking at development in the embryo, there comes a point when they become specialized, which is why when you look at an, um, a fetus, a developing fetus, you know, you have the formation of certain structures at different times because specialization of the cells occur. Their signals are sent and telling them, look, we want you to become a leg, we want you to become a head, we want you to become an arm. And when that signal is sent, those cells, because they do replicate, keep replicating, but they specifically replicate according to the signal that is sent to them. All right. So movement, we looked at cells. We looked at how you could look at these cells via using a microscope. We look at the relative size of things, appreciating how small things really are. Next thing we want to appreciate after we looked at all the organelles and their function is how do these things move across the membrane? Well, most of the times they move by simple diffusion. And what is simple diffusion? In nature, it's a property of, of physics as well. Things tend to move from an area of high concentration or high to low in general, not only in terms of concentration, but they move from high to low. And when you're looking at, let's say, a smell, which is why if somebody comes in and they smell in, um, you know, they've just put on perfume or cologne, you smell them right away because of the fact in the room has a relatively low concentration of that perfume or cologne. And since they come in and these molecules are transferred from their body because that's why they use alcohol in um, perfumes because alcohol is volatile, easily vi um, vaporized or turn into a vapor. And when they become vaporized via the heat from the person's body, it carries with them the fragrance molecules. And then those things go to your nose and you actually smell them. We'll speak more to that when we look at the nervous system, how you actually quote unquote smell things. A very fascinating uh, way that it is done because in actuality, you don't really smell things because um, everything is really electrical impulses. It is fascinating and yet scary at the same time because everything that we perceive is really electrical impulses. Um, because that is the only, th the only thing that the brain recognizes is electrical impulses. So when you smell something, it's not like smells go up to your brain. No, it's only electrical impulses. When you hear something, the sound doesn't go to your brain, only electrical impulses, and you perceive sound. When you taste something, same thing, electrical impulses go up to the brain, and it is perceived as a taste. But these things, they don't actually go to your brain. You know, it's, it's really fascinating when you think about it. All right, let's go forward. Simple diffusion, these molecules move from high to low. Moves, let's say cookies, mmm, smells good. The smell moves from the high area of high concentration around the cookies to your nose and you perceive it. So that's one of the um, general rules. Things move from high to low. Sometimes you do need, uh, a specific carrier to move things across. We mentioned earlier that how like glucose, you have specific gates that allow the movement of glucose or sugar from the blood into the cell. So here it is, the carrier molecules, glucose going into the cell, it binds and it gets in. And this is known as a carrier mediated facilitated diffusion. Then of course you have this one to move against a concentration gradient. What do you need? You need something uh, special, you need active transport, and this involves energy. So in this case, for instance, what we're seeing, right, movement across a concentration gradient. So the gradient, high to low, it goes in this, in this direction. But if you want it to move then from low to high, yeah, you'd need a very special um, channel or pump to move it and to move these substances against the normal concentration gradient. And to do that, you need energy in the form of ATP. That's coming like, think about if you're, you're looking at a waterfall and you want to go up the waterfall. Yeah, you could do it. 
we don't, we're not thinking, imagine has a ladder. It'll take a lot more energy to go up the waterfall than it is actually to come down the waterfall. Of course, it's easy to come down. But you know, imagine you have a ladder, non-slip. So you know you're moving up, it takes a lot of energy. In the body, when that occurs, you're moving against the concentration gradient. You need energy in the form of ATP and a specialized pump to do it. Okay, this is osmosis. What is osmosis? I forgot. So things generally move from high to low. What is osmosis? Um, is the movement of water does. molecules. Movement of water molecules from where to where? From area. Oh, yeah. concentration. Concentration. Very good. It makes no sense. I teach, you all know everything. Very good. Movement of water molecule from its area of high concentration to low. Now remember, diffusion is the general movement of molecules from high to low. Osmosis is a special case of diffusion where water moves from its area of high to its area of low concentration. And that is important, in particular, when we look at blood, blood cells, right, and the environment in which they are placed. All I have to say, we look at these in, in a little while when we look at some multiple choice question, but if you are put into an environment, in this case, um, high to low, the water environment here is high. So what happens? Water moves from high to low, it moves into the uh, blood cell, so the cell swells. In this case, if you notice, you have a lot of solute molecules. So therefore the concentration of the water is low relative to the amount of water inside the cell. So that means it's high in here, the water, low out there, water moves out. So the cell will shrink or cremate. If it's the same, the same amount of water that moves in is the same amount that moves out. This is known as isotonic, and therefore the cell remains the same size. So the, ideally, you always want to maintain this environment, the isotonic environment, as opposed to these other two, which could be very hazardous to your health. All right, exocytosis, just a means of letting things exocytose. When you're looking at the internal environment of the cell, if you want to get things out of the cell, you have to put it in a vesicle first. Then this vesicle fuses with the, the membrane, the plasma membrane, and then it releases its content on the outside. So what, would you, what could you say about the composition of the plasma membrane and the membrane of the vesicle? If you had to make a statement, what would you say about them? You'd say permeable? Yes, permeable, yes, yes. What would you say if you were examining it? Let's say you're on a microscope, or let's say you send it to be analyzed, and you know you get one report in your left hand and you have one report in your right hand, and you're looking at the numbers depending on, let's say, protein concentration, carbohydrate concentration, uh, fat concentration. What, what would those numbers look like? Would one be greater than one? or would they be exactly the same? So if it's permeable, one would not be the same as the other, sir? Right, but we're not really speaking to permeability. We're speaking about, so it fuses, it becomes, so here it is, the vesicle comes and it fuses with the membrane. So what does that tell you about the composition of this and the composition of this membrane? If it fuses, and it stays there. What does it tell you? It should be the same. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I know you never got a question like that. But one of the things to appreciate is that the composition of membranes in a cell, they are the same. Now, could you think of an advantage? Does that give the cell any advantage that the membrane, let's say, when you're looking at um, the membrane of a vesicle and the membrane of the plasma membrane, uh, let's say the membrane of the nucleus, the nuclear membrane. What advantage does that have if they are all made out of the same, same material? Um, uniformity. So that way, if they need to move something in or out, you can move it in and out itself. Brilliant, quickly. brilliant. Yes, yes. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah. Because think about if if it was that it was different. No, and you know, you had to reform this vesicle. You had to have a specific area. Let's say, you know, the vesicle, 
vesicle opening area and you have to put everything there and yeah uh, because you have to reuse it all the time but because they made out of the say you could just fuse it this could fuse with it as shown here and it's not a problem if something wants to come in it could just reform a vesicle using some of the same material because everything made out of the same material so it's very it's a very efficient way of doing things in a cell because of you can recycle it come like you're recycling the membrane all the time so it's not difficult at all no and you don't have to think overthink it in terms of putting it in a specific area let's say if it was let's say if you're looking at cloth let's say something make out of corduroy something make out of denim right so not to say you have a denim area and you have a corduroy area no everything make out of denim so psh, it don't make a difference you could just fuse where you want you know or you could just when you're coming in make a vesicle from any part of the cell. So it's very efficient for that reason. Good answer. All right, this is phagocytosis. And phagocytosis, phagocytosis means taking and eating. So here you have a bacteria, for instance, and what happened? Here you have a macrophage, part of the immune system, the white blood cell, and it forms around it, forming this vesicle. And what do you think? If you wanted to destroy it, what organelle do you think you will call on to destroy it? Or breaking up? Am I still breaking up? No, sir. No, sir. The lysosomes. Very good, lysosome. 10 point, yes, yes. So you make the vesicle, then you bring the lysosome. Now, why do you think they have to put it in a vesicle? Why didn't they just bring the scene? and just release the lysosome, the lysosome just open up and you know, release it into the cytoplasm in here. Why do you think it, it has to form a vesicle and the lysosome fuses with the vesicle and only releases the contents or the chemicals in here? What would happen if it released it all over? What would happen to the macrophage? It would destroy other organs. Thank you. It would destroy yeah. everything else. So what would happen to this macrophage? Da 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 da. What would happen? There. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you would kill the macrophage. And that process, what is that process known as? When you're killing, let's say destroying the cell itself. We look at it. It meant we mentioned it before. It begins with E. That is some kind of cell apoptosis. death. Thank you. Apoptosis. apoptosis. Yeah. So that is what happens with apoptosis, right? In terms of the cell gets a signal and it tells it, it tells the lysosome, uh, here what's going on. Things are happening, open. Could you think of a time when a cell would want to kill itself? Now remember, these are, so we're looking at, this is a, a macrophage, a particular cell. When would a cell want to kill itself? And don't say to banker. When would a cell want to kill itself? One word begins with D. Disease? Thank you. Yes, yes, very good, Crystal. If it is that uh, a cell, let's say a cell is part of a tissue, so you know it's related cells, and it's recognizing that certain disease come, is coming along, let's say cancer, right? And hello, it's sending all these signals to the macrophages, and but yet still the cancer still coming down the track. So what would it do? Yeah, it would destroy itself because, in particular, um, if you're looking, let's say, at viral cells something coming into the cell that is causing harm and replicating and moving on, which is what viruses do. Viruses could only replicate in a cell. They have no machinery of their own to actually replicate. So what the cell would, would do if it's found, or if it finds that you know it, viruses are invading it and it's sending out signals, I say, for help from the immune system, but it's not coming, the cell could kill itself by a process known as apoptosis. So in doing, what I will do to the viruses that are present in the cell? What would happen to the viruses? If the cell kills itself, imagine viruses, remember they're really it small. Die. All it these would viruses die. would die, yeah. So in killing itself, it also kills the viruses, right? So sometimes you do get those signals being sent to some cells, kill yourself, kill yourself. And they, they follow, Trump and follow suit for the greater good. Because if they kill themselves, kill the viruses within them, now the disease wouldn't spread to other parts. Yeah, so that's very good.
All right, so nice homework, Nicolais. Labs begin next week, complete the questions in the handout. You wouldn't have that to do in terms of the questions. Begin revision and preparation for assessment one. Yeah. Liaise with group members to plan for the project. Yeah, and labs begin next week. Yeah, all right, so they'll have- Excuse you, sir. Go ahead. So, um, what do you mean by liaise with group members? I mean, who are the group members? So. Let me see. So you all are doing, who, 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 I am your lab instructor, yeah? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, that means we haven't formed any groups yet. So, yeah, okay. Though, 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 those, I would say, though, though study this one in terms of, um, we'll, we'll form the groups next week. So don't worry about that thus far. Or I'll put something in the chat. So don't hit your head with this one too much. Liaise with group members to plan for the project. And this, the project itself is due in January. So, when we go to the lab next week, I'll talk more about that. So don't hurt your head with this one too much, okay? All right. Excuse me, sir. Yes, go ahead. When is assessment one? I'm a new student to the class. This is my first session. That's why I Really? Who is that? Chelsea. Chelsea, Chelsea you was on roll? I called your name Chelsea? Yes, you did. Okay, now when you was on roll. All right. So when is the assessment? Well, Chelsea, to be honest, all that information is on the lab page. But the lab page is done. I got assurances from IT it will be up this today. So all that being said, let me write it down on my list of things to do. I will send a document because I have a document already prepared that have a list of the um where is it? Uh, good notes. Yeah, okay. All right, so send list of assignments to SNF1 um, WhatsApp, okay? I'll do that at the end of class, okay? I'll send the list for you. Thank you. Are you part of the WhatsApp group, Chelsea? Yes, I was added. Okay, great, okay, great. Yeah, so I'll put it in there. I'll do that and I would send this as well, this PowerPoint. All right, so let's look at some questions. That is always a nice way to actually test, you know, um, Let me see if I could find. Da, da, da. Oh, here it is. It was hiding from me. 